Good morning. My name is Sandy McCandless. I'm a partner at Denton's in San Francisco and uh, want to welcome you to our program today uh, on uh, navigating the workplace of the, re of the future, uh, remote working considerations for employees. Uh, we have a full agenda. We're going to begin this morning uh, when we uh, get to the presentation with trends in remote working. We'll start with health and safety uh, concerns uh, as drivers for remote working arrangements, understanding liability concerns, OSHA obligations, mental health challenges, and then we'll turn to tax implications, employer and employee level considerations. Uh, there are a variety of uh, tax implications, both federal and state. Uh, we will address international remote work from a tax point of view. Best practices and considerations will end that segment. Then we'll turn to general employment issues, remote work requests by existing employees, hiring of employees in new states, employment risks, both statutory and common law coverage, uh, and uh, international doing business analysis. And then we'll end with some takeaways uh, in the hope that we'll have some time to do that. So again, I'm Sandy McCandless. I'm a Denton's in the San Francisco Bay Area. Joining me today are Beth Nygut, Executive Vice President of EMC Insurance Companies, uh, Bailey Rose, uh, who's a Denton's partner in Louisville, Julie Vanneman is a Denton's shareholder in Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, I wanna make, do some Housekeeping notes before we start. Uh, always important because uh, because you want to be sure you get CLE credit if uh, you're eligible for it. So all attendee lines have been muted to avoid background noise. If you have questions during the program, submit them through the chat at the bottom of your screen. If we don't get to your questions during the webinar, we'll follow up after the program. The webinar will be recorded and circulated to registrants after the event by email. If you have follow-up questions at that time, reach out to the key contacts listed in the email communication. But note that uh, we can only issue CLE credit for attendance during the live broadcast. Important regarding CLE credit, the webinar window must remain open for the entire program and be the only window at the forefront of your screen. WebEx detects if you minimize the program or use the computer outside the webinar software, which would mean you won't get CLE credit. If you're in New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania and have a license there, listen for the code word given during the program. When prompted, you'll need to enter the code words into the Q&A section of the screen. If you don't have a New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania license, you can disregard the code words. And now we'll begin with Beth Nygut. Um, and, and actually, it's Beth Nygut. Um, and I apologize for the mispronunciation. It's a new name to me, but I'm, I'm thrilled to get to know Beth, who has fabulous insights on remote work and a lot of practical experience. So uh, Beth, uh, please begin with remote work friends. Good morning. Well, thank you, Sandy. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and um, happy to provide some insights from the perspective of an employer. A uh, little bit, um, just briefly, EMC Insurance Companies is a commercial property and casualty insurance company. We are headquartered in Des Moines, Iowa, but we do have offices throughout the U.S. employing um, roughly 2,200 um, team members with about 1,100 in the Des Moines campus and then the rest spread out throughout the, the U.S. And as this first slide indicates, more and more of our team members are working remotely. And so um, just the insight um, to provide today really is, is from the perspective of what um, EMC has been seen and, and just to provide some input. And I'm sure for those of you in the HR space who are attending today, um, probably preaching to the choir because I think that we're, we're seeing a lot of the same thing. And it used to be um, pre-pandemic that um, remote was um, kind of taking, taking root and it would be um, in, in different pockets. Um, but now remote work and flexibility is an expectation that we're seeing just as is competitive compensation and, and benefits. It is essentially a requirement. 
And one of the things that we have noticed is if we are posting for a position, and if we've put in there that even a preference for relocation or on site is indicated in the posting, we will get significantly fewer applications. We've had several instances where then we've gone back and we've removed that from the posting and revisited and allowed for it to be remote. And then, I mean, just from an anecdotal perspective, 50% um, plus more applicants in the pool. So absolutely, this is a, um, a way of working that is here to stay and, and not seen as a benefit, but as an expectation. And so I think that what we're looking at here is both from a leadership perspective, how do we give um, leaders and employers the necessary tools in their toolbox to really think about um, how to navigate in an environment that, that we've really not been in, whether we're talking about return to office and what does flexible uh, work arrangements look like, um, and how do you navigate that? How do you require, can you require on site? And then the vast, um, um, all the different issues that, that stem to that. And we'll be visiting about those in some of the various areas today. And um, again, preaching to the choir, I'm sure with a lot of the HR professionals on the screen, um, but the goal is really learning from each other and creating a better toolbox. The name of the game, which is to retain the, the talent that is needed within our industries, because we're also aware of the war on talent and the great resignation. And how do we combat that? How do we stem that tide? And really making sure that the tools in that toolbox, and we'll be talking about a few of these with respect to health and safety, tax implications, and then general employment. What can we do to really make sure that we are giving you that uh, new and improved toolbox? So with that, I will turn it over and we can start talking about the health and safety aspect. Thanks, Beth. Um, so I practice occupational safety and health law, and I've been dealing extensively with COVID over the last couple of years. This part of the presentation will look first at health and safety concerns as part of the rationale that's increasing the use of remote work. Then it's some health and safety issues for remote workers. And finally, a focus on mental health. Next slide. So first, health and safety obligations and how they affect remote working. Some employers have gone 100% remote, but many have hybrid formats. With any in-person presence, there could be concerns about health and safety in the workplace. Under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, employers must provide a, health, a safe and healthy workplace. This is referred to as the General Duty Clause. Some states may also have specific standards addressing COVID in the workplace. Here are some practical considerations for employers. First, ensure you have clear, up-to-date policies. Employees should know what to expect when they toggle between remote and in-office work. Communicate workplace rules to your employees. Emphasize safety precautions to help people feel safe about coming in. Have a mechanism to track workplace access so you can identify who has been in the workplace. This is especially significant when people don't have consistent schedules for remote versus in-person work. Clarify what will happen if an employee needs to quarantine. Is remote work an option available only to those who are classified as remote workers? Or is it something that can be available to somebody who needs to quarantine? Next. So some workers may be reluctant to return to the workplace because of their own health and safety concerns. OSHA is particularly concerned with what it calls at-risk workers, such as people who are immunocompromised. OSHA is not the enforcer of the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA, but OSHA's current COVID guidance recognizes that under the ADA, workers with disabilities may be legally entitled to reasonable accommodations that protect them from the risk of contracting COVID. Next. So how should workers handle these requests for remote working because of their own concerns? I'm going to start with an old case, old as in 2020, which seems like a very long time ago. Um, the facts of this case are from a pre-vaccination context, so they are a bit different, but I think it's still interesting. In this case, plaintiff who had asthma was concerned about exposure to COVID. Early in the pandemic, plaintiff worked remotely. But after a few months, the employer wanted folks to come back in. Plaintiff wanted to keep working from home. The employer said no. So 
In this case, the plaintiff was likely to prevail, according to the court, on the contention that asthma was a disability, at least at this time in the COVID pandemic in 2020. The plaintiff could perform the essential functions of the job. Notably, she'd been working successfully remotely for a few months already. And the company had not provided reasonable accommodations because it not sufficiently responded to plaintiff's health concerns. Next slide. So the real reason I chose this case is because of this little comment and the opinion. The company claimed that it had accommodated plaintiff by implementing a range of safety concerns, like providing masks and hand sanitizer. And the court was really not that convinced. The company was taking those steps generally. They weren't a specific response to plaintiff's condition. And according to the court, these were so-called accommodations that were really just workplace safety rules that should have been in place regardless. Also in this case, the company made a very blanket statement that everybody had to come back in plaintiff's job category. And this was not an individualized look at her particular situation. Next. So what are some lessons learned from this case? First, the more convincing you are about how safe and healthy workplace is, perhaps the less likely you will be to encounter objections from people about in-person work. That said, that's not gonna solve the problem entirely if there are people who are still concerned about coming in. Also, you can't control all conditions that matter. So for example, some people may be concerned about um, commuting in via public transportation. If employees are teleworking successfully, what is your argument for bringing them back? Consider the risk of taking the position that everyone has to come back um, and can't perform the essential functions of the job if that's what they've been doing for months or even years by this point. And then think about what accommodations you could offer. Think about the flexibility that you might be willing to provide, but one caveat, if you're granting flexibility that's not legally required, Consider whether you're opening yourself up to claims of discrimination because one person's request was granted when another's was denied. Next. So now I'm gonna move on to people's concerns because they are caregivers. Some employees are caregivers for children younger than five who are currently ineligible to take the vaccine. And some are caregivers for people who are immunocompromised or who are otherwise at higher risk for COVID. And these employees may seek remote working arrangements. Next. So the EEOC recently released guidance on COVID and caregiver discrimination. Generally, federal employment laws don't prohibit employment discrimination based solely on caregiver status, but there are state or local non-discrimination laws that might apply, and there might be other laws that might apply, such as the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. And I won't go into all of it now, but I will point to this site that was posted that's specifically about the potential for caregiver discrimination. Next. All right, moving along quickly. Second part of my presentation is about the rules for remote work. Um, and I'll say, you know, the, the, the rules of the road, even though I acknowledge that people are not getting on the road uh, to go to work. And I specifically will look at this from an OSHA perspective. Next. So, OSHA is not going to inspect your employees' home offices. It does not expect you to inspect your employees' home offices. It's not gonna hold you liable for home offices. The distinction that's important here is the difference between a home office and a home-based work site. So if there's some sort of manufacturing that's going on at home, then OSHA is going to get more concerned. OSHA is not gonna to respond to a complaint about a home office, but it might respond to a complaint about a home-based work site. The employer is responsible for materials, equipment, or work, process that the work processes that the employer provides or requires to be used at a home-based work site. Next. So don't be lulled into a false sense of security. Just because OSHA is not going to inspect does not mean that you don't have any obligations for an injury that might occur at home. So a covered employers do need to follow the rules for recording and potentially reporting injuries that occur at home. So for an injury to be potentially recordable, you need to think about whether it's work-related. That means that the injury has to arise, uh, occur in the course of, and arise out of the employee's employment. 
it has to be a new case, and it has to meet one or more of OCHA's recording criteria. Next. All right, so now I'm gonna segue into a focus on mental health, just because I think it's a good way of looking at health and safety issues in the workplace, particularly in this era. The COVID pandemic has caused enormous challenges for many people. The number of people seeking mental health help for mental health conditions has risen, particularly for anxiety and depression. And social distancing, quarantine, and isolation can be very hard on people. So some people, especially the more enthusiastic extroverts amongst us, might be thrilled about the chance to go back to work. But some people are quite anxious about it, and they really want to continue remote working, at least partially. Uh, just yesterday, actually, OSHA issued an announcement about concerns about mental health in the workplace, including um, steps that employers can take in terms of suicide prevention. So given the extensiveness of mental health issues in the COVID era, it's important to be sensitive to employees' mental health concerns and to ensure that you're not discriminating against people if there's a mental health condition that qualifies as, as a disability under the ADA. So under the ADA, I'm going to talk about a case, Zuckerman. This is from the slightly more recent past in 2021. Um, in this case, the plaintiff worked from home in the early part of the pandemic, just like the last one, but then the employer brought people back. It's a complex case that involves other claims, but I'm just gonna focus on the mental health concerns. The plaintiff asked to be continued to allow, um, to continue remote working as a reasonable accommodation for her generalized anxiety disorder. The company refused to request, and then she was terminated. So under this test, she met the first element because she had an impairment, but she failed to be specific enough about her limitations caused by that impairment, so she didn't state a claim. Next slide. So again, I chose this case for one particular passage in it that I think is really useful and I want to highlight. It's in a footnote. Lawyers sometimes love footnotes. Um, Plaintiff claimed that she performed the essential functions of her job, so remote working was a reasonable accommodation. But the court was not persuaded. According to the court, the fact that everyone else was going back to work mattered. If everyone else was back, then could she really still perform the functions of her job if she was remote? So note the difference between this case from late 2021 and the previous case from 2020, where the plaintiff was more successful on her claims. In this case, the court is saying, everyone else is back, so maybe plaintiff needs to be back as well. So the difference could be factual differences in the cases, obviously. I think the difference is also in the context um, when more people are going back and opinions are changing about going back to work. So the message generally is to be careful about how you respond to employees' physical and mental health conditions in the workplace. And now I'm gonna bounce it back to Beth. Thank you, Julie. Um, and I want to pick up on one of the comments that you had indicated, um, because I think it's key, which is consider the rationale. And, and with so much of this, I mean, with mental health and May is mental health awareness is what is the rationale? Why are you having the policies? Are you changing your policies? What what do you what does your handbook to your policies look like? Are they promoting whole holistic safety and health and wellness? Um, asking um, you know, if, if employees are reluctant to come back to the office and they have been working successfully remotely, what is the harm in allowing those um, employees to continue to work remotely? Uh, again, what are the parameters, what are the boundaries so you can ensure consistency and the application of any rules that you may have, but it's engaging with your employees to have an understanding about what works for them and why. And it's not mutually exclusive that you can't have business results and be flexible. The two can coexist. And in fact, when that happens, you may be able to buck that trend of, of significant turnover and establish greater engagement, more psychological safety with your, with your employee base. Um, one of the statistics that has stuck with us is when we um, were taking a look at a recent McKinsey study, that 42% of women and 35% of men have reported being often or almost always burnt out, and 85% reported their well being had declined during the pandemic. As employers, we have an opportunity to help our employees in this space. 
and to think about considering the rationale, connecting with your employees, engaging with them, what works if they were successful in that remote type of an environment? What is the rationale if requiring every to come, everyone to come back into the office? Or what are you going to gain if you have a flexible approach with consistency in the application? And that this gets back into your expectations, clear policies, education, communication, training. One of the things that we found helpful is making sure that there is a easy to access repository of these types of policies that apply to whether it's um, mental health issues, resources, EAP, what other parameters around flexibility in the workplace to really be able to help guide and again, bring some consistency and education and awareness to this uh, ever changing and evolving environment. But having a resource where both employees and managers and leaders know they can go to on a consistent basis to find that information, to find that access, um, at least for us, has allowed us to be successful in this space. And uh, now we're going to roll right into tax implications, which I know is a, a smooth transition from mental health uh, into into tax law for sure. Um, so, it, you know, we're, we're really in this unique environment where uh, over the last couple of years, there has been this explosion in remote work. Uh, obviously, in 2020, you know, it, it, that was by necessity. That was, um, you know, something that taxing authorities were experiencing themselves as employers. And so a lot of those taxing authorities were offering some, you know, some grace in 2020. They were saying, okay, this is pandemic related. This is going to be temporary. Uh, you know, these remote work arrangements are just kind of formal, um, maybe informal or informal, but we're going to allow employees and employers to, you know, kind of have a year of, of us not challenging uh, what's going on here because you know, there's there's uh, states that declared emergencies. Um, you know, the, the the federal government declared states of emergency, and so taxing authorities were not really wading into the the weeds there on um, you know what every single employer or employee was doing with respect to remote work. But now that we're a couple of years into this, uh, states and localities are becoming a little bit more aggressive in looking into uh, where employees are actually physically working. Um, now that they've kind of seen revenue impacts start to hit from, you know, all of the, uh, the, the impacts uh, that arose as a result of the pandemic. Um, so it's really, really vitally important that as employers uh, that you begin reviewing your current policies and your realities uh, to prepare for potential uh, federal, state, and very importantly, local tax implications, um, which can include things like um, uh, state nexus for sales tax purposes uh, uh, coming up for you in, in states where it has not uh, previously, uh, withholding and employment tax obligations, uh, corporate income tax uh, compliance and, and questions of doing business, uh, and then in the, uh, the international context, permanent establishment uh, questions, and then um, local license taxes, which uh, are, are very, very highly specific. And if you live in a state like I do, like Kentucky, um, that has uh, many, many, many counties, uh, you're dealing with many, many, many potential localities where uh, your employees may have, um, you know, begun working uh, more or less permanently and where you did not have a filing obligation before. Uh, next slide, please. So in the sales tax and income tax realm, um, a little background here. Uh, states are able to impose a sales tax where there is a physical presence. So if the employer, the company has a physical presence uh, in a state, then that state is able to assert their sales tax on that employer. So if you are uh, the type of business that sells uh, tangible personal property, uh, you're probably very, very aware of this fact. Uh, but physical presence can include a variety of things so that can include employees. Um, and so if before the pandemic, you only had employees in one state, say uh, all of your employees came to the office, they commuted in um, and they all lived in Indiana. Then, you know, you had that physical presence in Indiana as a result of, of their physical presence, your home office was there, et cetera. Um, however, if during the pandemic and, you know, continuing on uh, into 2022, you've allowed employees to work remotely, 
then it could be that those employees, by their physical presence in that state, uh, could trigger a sales tax collection and reporting obligation, um, even if you're not doing much business in that state. So even if you're only making a few sales uh, into a particular state, and so previously you were able to say, well, I'm not meeting those economic nexus uh, thresholds that require me to register uh, with the state taxing authority to collect and remit sales tax, um, all of a sudden kind of having those, uh, those employees in a particular state can mean that a court would say, I'm sorry, you've got physical presence um, and you've got a, uh, a registration requirement, a compliance requirement, a filing requirement, and, uh, and, and we're going to uh, make sure you do that going forward. Uh, in the corporate income tax space uh, or franchise tax uh, in certain states, um, these, these kinds of taxes are asserted on taxpayers that are doing business in a particular state. And each state has its own definition of what doing business means. Um, but uh, for, for many, many states, that definition includes uh, having employees uh, in the state. So again, if all of a sudden you've got employees who uh, maybe previously worked in your home office in one state but are now kind of spread all over the place, uh, that can be a, a predicate for the, the state taxing authority to say, you know, you're now doing business in this state uh, because you have employees there. Um, and I do want to caution, however, that uh, there is a law, a federal law, that prohibits states from imposing an income tax uh, on a taxpayer whose sole connection to the state uh, is employees who engage in mere solicitation. So if you have uh, employees in one state who are um, really, you know, maybe they're at a call center and they're they're calling folks, um, asking them to buy your product, um, they are, you know, sales reps, things like that. If all they are doing within the state is um, soliciting sales, then uh, this the state cannot say that that alone is enough to assort uh, uh, to assert. I'm sorry, a, a corporate income tax. And again, that's only in the income tax realm. On the sales tax side, it's it's different. But um, but just you want to keep that in mind because we've seen states uh, kind of tiptoe past that uh, in 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 many instances. Uh, and next slide, please. Um, so a, a huge issue uh, we are seeing more and more is uh, in the employee withholding and payroll tax realm. Uh, so whereas the, the previous taxes we discussed, the sales tax and the corporate income tax are, um, are very important on the, the entity level, the business level, uh, this is one that affects both the entity and then also, of course, your employees. And so, um, you know, as we all know, as, as employees ourselves uh, working for businesses, um, we're, we're subject to tax on all of our income in the state where we reside. That's the general rule. Uh, so as a Kentucky resident, I am subject to Kentucky income tax. Um, everybody on this call, no matter where you're living, um, if, if your state has an income tax, then, then you are subject to all a tax on all of the income uh, in that state where you're a resident. Um, however, you're also subject to income tax uh, in a state where you perform services. Um, and so an employer uh, is obligated to withhold state income taxes on such services absent a safe harbor or reciprocal agreement. So when you are working in a particular state, uh, maybe that's not the state where you're, you reside, there's a general rule that actually you're going to be subject to tax in that state. Now, if the practical reality is we don't see that arise a lot because many, many states have uh, reciprocal agreements with, with their neighboring states to protect employees who might live just across the border but commute into to another state. So for example, uh, I live in Louisville, I'm just across the river from Southern Indiana, and Indiana and Kentucky have an agreement by which you know they're not gonna have crazy filings come in where someone's gotta file for, um, they've gotta report all their income in one state and file for a refund based on the taxes they paid to another state. It just kind of simplifies it. And it says, you know what, if you're a Kentucky resident, even if you're working in Indiana, we're just going to go ahead and let Kentucky tax your income. And we'll do the same thing for anybody who is living in Indiana, but commuting to Kentucky. So that just sort of simplifies matters. Um, but only a few states are kind of providing this safe harbor on the one hand, uh, which allows employees to work in the state for a certain number of days uh, without triggering the employee's obligation uh, to, to pay taxes and the employer's obligation to withhold taxes. So if you only travel to a state a few days a year for work, most states are going to say, um, or, or you know, a few states are going to say, we're not going to require you to report the income that you made during those days. You know, we, we, we don't want to hear about it. It's okay. It's all going to come out in the wash. Um, 
And uh, many states um, do not have a safe harbor. And even if you work in the state for as little as one day, uh, then, then you can become subject to tax uh, in that state. And, uh, you know, practically speaking, um, states are not really coming after the vast majority of people. Uh, they, they don't know when you're traveling uh, and things like that. But now, obviously, as the pandemic has continued, as people have been working remotely uh, more often, maybe they're taking the opportunity to say, well, I can work wherever I want. So maybe I, you know, I was going to go on vacation for a week, but maybe I just stay in this state for a month. Um, as things like that start to happen more and more frequently, uh, states are kind of becoming a little bit more aware of these different arrangements that are that are coming up, and they're they're starting to say, you know what, we we want tax if if that person was working here uh, for for many weeks at a time or for or in a permanent arrangement, uh, we're interested in that. We want uh, we want those tax dollars. Our laws allow us to assert it, and uh, and we're going to start coming after it. And then, of course, as the employer, uh, that uh, obligation um, rolls over to you as well. Um, and so, again, uh, these reciprocal agreements, uh, different from the safe harbor, the reciprocal agreements uh, kind of allow these cross-border issues to, to work themselves out a little bit. Um, and so that that's helpful um, for, for employers to make sure that they're withholding correctly. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and so, uh, again, there are many states that have these reciprocal agreements with border states. Um, but then certain other states, um, uh, New York, Delaware, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut are examples. They have rules and requirements for withholding that depend on whether the employee is working from home for his or her own convenience or the convenience uh, of the employer. So uh, there, there can be differences um, in that respect. And so, you know, many times now after we've, um, you know, during the pandemic's early days, uh, it, it really was not the employee's choice to work from home. But uh, as we've continued on, as we heard from Beth, you know, more and more people are requesting that accommodation to work from home. And so uh, it's shifted from uh, being a, a test of convenience for the employee um, or being a test of convenience from the employer uh, to one uh, of the employee. And so employers need to be aware of that uh, requirement as well. Um, and then, of course, localities may also have uh, license or occupational taxes based on where the work is physically performed. Uh, so Kentucky is one of those those states, um, and there are many others as well that assert uh, kind of an occupational license tax, which essentially says for the privilege of working in this county or in this city, uh, we're going to assert um, a tax uh, on the employee um, because they're physically working here. Um, and so we're seeing this arise a lot more um, uh, during the last couple of years, because while there are fewer employees who might work across the border uh, of a state, there are a lot more employees who commuted in from outside counties. So you can imagine it's a lot easier to uh, to think about um, an employee who maybe lived in the suburbs uh, of, of where your headquarters are located and commuted in every day to now working every single day in that suburb in a different county. And now all of a sudden, instead of paying taxes in the city that had an occupational license tax, it's paying tax, the employee would be responsible for taxes out in that suburb county. Um, and again, each of these issues can create uh, withholding obligations for the employer um, and, uh, and are important to consider. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, here's a, here's just kind of an example um, of, of how uh, one state is is tackling these issues. Um, so Kentucky put out guidance um, as more and more taxpayers, uh, employers, employees were asking, "Hey, how are you going to treat um, you know these these remote working issues?" Uh, the Kentucky Department of Revenue put out um, a statement that said, "You know, hey, we as the state." Uh, taxing authority, we don't administer the license or occupational taxes that are imposed by cities, counties, and other local jurisdictions. Um, as the state, they said, you know, for Kentucky state income tax purposes, employers employing Kentucky residents and or non-residents who reside in states with which Kentucky has a reciprocal agreement will not need to change their current withholding practices during the period when these employees are working from home. Um, but uh, requirements for withholding of tax in either case remain unchanged by restrictions related to the COVID-19 public health emergency. 
and they said that they're going to continue reviewing um, Kentucky state income tax nexus determinations on a case by case basis. So this was Kentucky's way of saying, uh, you know, when it comes to the corporate income tax, um, we will address nexus questions as they come up, which which really means they're going to look into all the facts and circumstances um, that uh, that apply to your company. And so if you have many, many employees who now are working remotely in Kentucky, uh, that can be a basis for um, the KDOR to, to assert a corporate income tax uh, on, on your business, even though it may not have any other connection to the state. The next slide. Um, and so, as you might imagine, uh, it's, it's already complicated enough being in uh, the, the United States only and having employees kind of moving cross border, uh, you know, within within the 50 states, but international remote work is even more complex. So, uh, there are additional costs, complexity and burdens for both employer and employee. Um, so, of course, you can have a taxable presence risk um, if you all of a sudden have employees who are working uh, in the United States who weren't working there before if your company is a foreign company. Uh, or if you're a United States company and you have employees who are now working uh, in an international jurisdiction, there can be additional compliance there. Um, immigration laws come into play here as well um, with visa compliance. Um, you'll need to make sure you're uh, complying with foreign employment law. Um, and and just figuring out where your employees have tax residency. So this um, this can get into a whole morass of issues as well. Next slide, please. Um, and so one uh, one illustration here is for uh, you know an inbound question. So a foreign person um, must file a U.S. tax return and pay U.S. tax on uh, their effectively connected income. Um, when it is engaged in the conduct of a trader business in the United States, um, which is known as ETOB. Um, and so engage in a trader business is somewhat of an amorphous standard. And so there's going to be all facts and circumstances that are considered. Um, but if a foreign uh, entity performs personal services within the United States through its employees, uh, the foreign entity is going to be considered to be engaged in a trader business here. So if you have uh, an employee uh, despite the fact that you may have no other presence in the United States, if you have an employee in the United States, all of a sudden um, you can be found to be engaged in a trader business here, which will open you up to uh, filing obligations um, on the federal level. Next slide, please. Um, and income tax treaties are a huge issue that that come into play here. Um, so you know you want to figure out whether the U.S. has an income tax with the foreign country where you may now have an employee. Um, you want to ask whether uh, the foreign employers either already has a permanent established in the United States, which is a fixed place of business um, through which that business or foreign person, um, for the, through which the business of a foreign person is wholly or partly carried on. So if you already have that, the question becomes a little bit easier. But if this is your first employee who's working in the United States, um, then that can be again a basis for, the, for that to be created. Um, and so you want to be aware of what functions the employee is going to be carrying out. If they're, you know, a really uh, sophisticated employee, um, highly paid uh, executive type of employee, then there's a much higher risk that you're going to be found to be carrying on a trader business here than if it's someone who might um, be kind of a, a office worker um, on a on a lower pay scale. Um, that that might not be uh, enough to to kind of give you that presence. But again, just very important to be aware of where your employees are. Um, because it can create filing obligations for you as the employer as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then, of course, there are employee considerations here as well. So, though, you know, most of us are thinking, okay, what does my, what does the employer need to do? What does the company need to do? Um, as employers, we also are want to be concerned with uh, the happiness of our employees and making sure our employees know. Uh, what is going on with their tax withholding. Um, if, if you've ever had an issue where you've had an employee uh, whose withholding um, has been um, kind of messed up for whatever reason, whether it was just a you know, paperwork error or a computer glitch or uh, you know, somebody moved in the middle of the year and, and didn't tell anybody, it can be really, really uh, difficult for that employee to deal with a surprise kind of obligation there um, in, in terms of filing uh, taxes and then having a tax bill that they didn't expect because their withholding was not correct. Um, so you want to make sure that if you're making any changes to how you are treating employees and how you are treating their withholding, that they're aware of them. Um, employees, of course, have 
uh, the the responsibility to know um, how the tax law affects them person personally, and they have obligations to pay the tax themselves. Uh, but it's just really important um, to to make sure that they know um, everything as well. And then again, in the foreign context here, uh, it gets even more complex. So just be aware uh, of, of that as well. Um, and next slide. Um, and so, you know, what employers can do here, and I'd, I'd love to hear from Beth uh, a little bit on this point too. Um, but yeah, Beth, what what are you doing to make sure that um, that you are uh, taking this all into account and uh, and, and ensuring that that tax laws are are being um, observed? Um, absolutely. Thank you, Bailey. I think the biggest takeaway for us in this area with taxation has been kind of going back to the education and communication, especially around remote or flexible policies and work from home from, from employees who work from home. We've had several employees who actually have moved from the state of Iowa to Florida. Sometimes they tell us, sometimes they don't. When they don't, um, it ends up potentially costing us. So what we try to do is to create within our um, HRIS systems um, a checklist and kind of those triggers so that if somebody's moving, whether it's the employee or the manager of that employee, that there is a little bit of a tickler of everything that you have to do, including making sure that HR is aware of exactly where you're moving so that we can we really make sure from the withholding and the um, tax implications for the employee and for the employer are, are met and that we, we have that accurate data. So the, the single biggest thing is again, that education, clearly defined expectations and resources of what to do and when on a timely basis, and then having it in an easy to access repository, where to go to for questions. Um, that has been the biggest thing that the, working with payroll and our um, benefits team, you know, to make sure that there is education and clarity around all of these types of responsibilities. That's great. Yes, I think that's that's exactly the way to, to approach this um, is, is by communicating, by educating, uh, and by making sure you've got um, all of the kind of people in the room uh, who know, uh, one, what the employees are doing on the ground, and then two, from a, a company perspective, um, know what the, the company's obligations are. That's great. And on the next slide, we have, uh, as we mentioned, our CLE code word. Um, so, as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we just need to take a brief moment to satisfy CLE requirements by delivering the following code word, which is remote control. Uh, all New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania licensed attendees must type the word remote control into the Q&A section on the right hand side of your WebEx screen. Please make sure to hit the send button so that it registers. Uh, and that code word again is remote control. And please type that into the Q&A section uh, on the right side of your screen there. Um, we will go from there. So um, we've uh, heard about tax and health and safety with respect to moving employees into new states and or beginning operations in new states. But often the first questions we get are about general employment requirements. And this is true internationally. And before I address uh, the states, let me just say that when I get international questions about hiring or retaining people in uh, jurisdictions outside the United States, the first thing I do is call uh, or email one of my colleagues in one of the other Denton's jurisdictions who, just as we know, the life cycle of employment in the various states in the United States, hiring, retention, maintenance of employment and termination, um, it's essential to have counsel in, in, in the other international jurisdiction as questions occur. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so uh, general employment uh, issues include requests by existing employees, hiring of employees in new states, employment risks, and international questions. Next slide. Um, requests by existing employees. So, first of all, uh, Beth has emphasized how important it is to think about granting requests for remote work as a retention tool. I was speaking with a service provider to me personally who said, X person wants to be able to work at home. I want him in the office. 
And I had a dialogue with uh, that person who's also a friend about how important my perception was about the, the value of this individual as an employee and what the benefits might be of flexibility. Um, but a request for temporary remote work may lead to a permanent request. So we have to think, is this going to work out long term? And what are the legal implications if the person's working in a different state? And granting, and uh, Julie alluded to this, granting of a temporary accommodation becomes evidence of the ability to grant a regular accommodation. If it was working temporarily, why can't it work long term? So once granted, you may have to grant it long term. And we create a precedent when we allow one person to do remote work for the second person in a similar position with similar requirements who then requests to do remote work. We have to think about the long-term implications uh, of preferential treatment claims. We should recognize that it can be potentially more difficult to supervise or coordinate people who work remotely, and so we need to be prepared for that and have a game plan. And then often employers fail to think about the heightened travel costs of having people work all over the country and remotely. Next slide. Uh, exempt and non-employees. So which jobs can be performed off-site? Before COVID, I was told constantly by clients that non-exempt employees could not work off-site. Well, when uh, Denton's went remote due to COVID, I remember the day that <laughs> I was making sure that my secretary who was looking for a computer got one right away. She went home, had never worked at home before and was up online working immediately the next day. There was almost no break in time. But um, this being California in my case, she has to, she's non-exempt, she has to record the beginning and end of work, the beginning and ending of lunches. She has to take required breaks at certain times. Um, and for all non-exempt employees across the country, time recording is still essential, whether they work remotely or not, and the employer has to have a plan for that. And again, with respect to travel time, it can get quite expensive to have non-exempt employees traveling. Uh, commute time is not paid time, but other tra travel time is. So if someone in Minnesota is traveling to Illinois and is non-exempt, you have to look at the federal travel time rules. Next slide. Um, hiring of employees in new states. So this form that you're looking at here is uh, 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 California Labor Code section 2810.5, um, which requires that a specific form be filled out for non-exempt employees. Um, there's a, a, a different set of requirements for New York as another example, where written notice is required to all new employees, not just non-exempt of rates of pay, regular payday, address and phone number of the employer, et cetera. Again, either an employer form or a state form is required. So in each state and locality, what are the initial legal requirements? And of course, um, as was discussed earlier, a be doing business in, in a new state can be triggered by hiring one employee in that state. Very critical point. Um, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, all types of hiring documentation requirements have to be taken into account when you hire an employee in, in a new state. Go to the next slide, please. Um, but, I, you know, and I, and, and I wanna note that as you move people into different states or as they say, uh, for example, well, I've been working in Minnesota, but I wanna work in Wisconsin now, you have to figure out what are the requirements, the new requirements specifically in the new state. So sick leave, um, I was looking this morning at the sick leave requirements across the states. And so there are, there are states that, have, that don't have sick leave requirements, states that do, and states that have only locality sick leave requirements. 
So when the employee moves, what are the state and local sick leave requirements? I mean, that's an arena where what is required across the country is totally varied. Um, leaves of absence rules are different. Uh, different protected statuses, restrictive covenants are different, treated differently in every state. And I'm often called upon to tweak restrictive covenants for use in a different state. And there are specific legal requirements in terms of wording of confidential information and invention assignment agreements. Um, treatment of, of new employees in new states require addressing your written policies. Are you going to have a separate handbook for particular states? How will you, obviously, if you have one employee in Minnesota, you're not going to have a Minnesota handbook, but are there specific rules in that state that you have to deal with either in your written policies or in some communication to the employee? And then looking at the life cycle of the employee living in a new state uh, which was unanticipated before or hiring in new states. What are the entitlements? California requires payment of vacation or PTO on the last day of employment. Uh, many states do not, but all states have their own vacation requirements or lack thereof, and that has to be checked. Drafting of compliant release agreements is something I do on an ongoing basis. Um, more and more states are having their own requirements of what go into release agreements. California in particular has new non-disparagement rules that have affected all of the releases that I'm drafting. And I have a, a set of uh, the California rules in front of me when I'm drafting release agreements to, and, and, and employment policies to make sure that I'm complying with the new rules that have just gone into effect very recently. Next slide. Um, so, uh, we may be doing business in Nebraska if we hire someone in Nebraska. And I don't want to be doing business and have all of the corporate and tax requirements of Nebraska by hiring an employee in Nebraska. So, what do I do? Well, I could use a personnel employer organization, which has its own benefits and risks. For example, um, using a PEO often makes it easier. Uh, particularly, let's say you're a new employer, uh, to provide benefits to employees. There are many good personal employer organizations that provide a broad suite of benefits and other, and other uh, attributes of employment to you if you need them in a particular arena. Um, but a risk of uh, using a PEO is that, let's say if you have 15 employees and you're not governed by the federal Family and Medical Leave Act, but you're got, or the Warren Act, you may be having heightened legal requirements because you are working as a joint employer, which is what happens when you use a personnel employer organization. Then I'm asked, well, why don't I just make this person an independent contractor? That's often the worst option. Uh, treating someone as an independent contractor who is really legally an employee uh, allows that person later to make both misclassification and standard employment claims, and then the employer can get into big trouble with the state for misclassifying an employee as an independent contractor. Next slide. Um, so, uh, the employment risks. Uh, can be huge in operating in a new state. The question typically is, is there jurisdiction in a particular state and what's the effect of the use of a PEO? So again, I, I think life cycle, you're allowing someone to work remotely in Nebraska. What are the termination rights for that person in Nebraska? And some statutes will apply, some not based on the number of employees in a state. Um, but common law rights, like claims for breach of contract or personal injury, there's no defense based on the absence of sufficient employees in the state. So you're definitely assuming the obligations of a particular state's employment laws if you employ someone in a state. And an employee may have the benefits of more than one jurisdiction 
in certain cases. Next slide. So request to move countries, all of the above issues and more. So the first thing I ask when an employee asks to move countries and I'm asked by the client, should we allow this? I think, is it practical? If the employee wants to move to Tahiti, it may not be practical. Uh, and I had that question from many points of view. The doing business analysis needs to be done. If you hire an employee in Romania, will you be doing business in Romania? If so, are you going to use a personnel employer organization? And what are the risks of independent contractor status in that particular jurisdiction? Um, so I've been watching the clock and uh, we're close to the end. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and my key takeaway is plan ahead, uh, decide the issues and implications up front, and that includes the whole life cycle of employment. Assume the worst. What's going to happen if it goes wrong? You've had a contractor in Hungary for 10 years. How much are you going to owe to the government if that person makes a complaint that, uh, that, that they were improperly classified as a contractor? So in recognize the importance of being flexible um, with the productive and valued employee, but take into account the potential risks. So that was my key takeaway. Um, uh, Beth, do you have a key takeaway? Thank you, Sandy. Um, a few, and, and um, I think the biggest thing from uh, an employer standpoint, and I, I do say this cognizant of the fact that EMC is a larger employer, and we we do employ um, uh, folks in, in virtually every every state. So for us, a lot of these issues we have the resources, and, and we've got it built into our um, HRIS systems, which absolutely does help. Smaller employers, um, to your point, are really going to have to wrestle with the the business analysis of why this may or may not make sense to allow employees to um, to be relocated in different states, to do business in different states. All of that absolutely plays a very important part from a standpoint of business practicality, as well as your resources and your prioritization. Um, what is it that your business goals are? One of the things that I would actually also like to overlay on top of this is the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion into every facet of this discussion. Um, prior to my work here at EMC, um, I was an employment litigation attorney for um, over 14 years. And so, if there is a desire to have an inclusive um, organization where diversity and equity are also absolutely valued and you want to make sure that underrepresented demographics have a voice and are seen, providing flexibility and providing the hybrid work environment can be an incredibly strong um, um, initiative that you can uh, allow for your employees that's also going to allow you to move the needle forward with your DEI journey. And so I would throw that out there that there are ways to um, be thoughtful and to consider all of the legal implications that have been raised and get to that state of a, a very robust um, and engaging hybrid work environment that again, it's not zero sum that will allow businesses to grow and thrive while meeting all the legal requirements um, and regulations and providing flexibility to your employees. It may be um, a little bit of, of a um, more onerous process to go through to get there, but in the end, at least EMC has found that by engaging in this type of analysis with what works for our employees, providing flexibility, keeping in mind um, the legal um, and cultural requirements that, that are important and um, compliance issues, there's a way that, that you can, um, that you can kind of thread that needle and do so successfully. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, your insights have been great. And I, I appreciate the fact that you mentioned the importance of considering diversity and inclusion in this process. So uh, we've concluded this program. We wanna thank you. We're available to answer questions afterwards. Please feel free to reach out to any one of us. And uh, thank you again for attending.